At 12 noon on July 20, 1944, Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg enters the office complex of Field Marshal Keitel at Wolfschanze, the Führer's headquarters for the Eastern Front in East Prussia. He is scheduled to report to Hitler on the readiness of the home army. Keitel informs the officers that the briefing will not take place in the bunker as usual, but in the nearby conference room of the Lagerbarak, the situation barracks. Keitel beckons the officers to follow him, but Stauffenberg stops and asks if he can change his shirt. Keitel's aide, John von Freyend, takes him to a nearby bedroom. While Stauffenberg is inside, the phone rings. It is General Felgebel, head of the communications post. Stauffenberg says he will call back as soon as possible. Now Keitel gets impatient. Stauffenberg emerges at last, and the officers continue on their journey to the conference room located on the other side of the inner security zone. At 12.35 p.m., Stauffenberg enters the conference room. Exactly seven minutes later, the world is shattered. Thus begins one of the most astonishing chapters in the history of World War II, an assassination attempt on the Fuhrer by a group of senior officers at the very pinnacle of German military might. This is the untold eyewitness story of Operation Valkyrie. By 1934, one year after his appointment as Chancellor, Hitler was the undisputed master of Germany. All the opposition parties in the Reichstag had been outlawed, with most of the party leadership in jail. Hitler's National Socialist, or Nazi, party was now in full control of the country. When the Reich president, the venerable Paul von Hindenburg, conveniently passed away, Hitler combined the office of chancellor and the president into one new position, that of Führer, supreme leader of the German nation. Anticipating opposition from the church, Hitler had concluded a concordat with the Vatican in 1933, thus preempting any criticism from the Catholic Church. But individual priests and Protestant clergy did speak out, including Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Niemöller, and Bishop Clemens von Gallen. Hitler started to kill um, mentally and, and physically handicapped children in, in killing centers around Germany. These killing centers were actually the apprenticeships for the people who would go on to run the death camps. Um, and Galen found out about this, and it was Galen, most of all, speaking from his pulpit, who got this stopped. Eben der Dietrich Bonhoeffer, äh, der bekannte Theologe, und gegen deren Einstellung war eben dieses ganze System. There was a split actually within the Protestant Church because one side of the Protestant Church became very, uh, very loyal to the regime, as as actually the Protestant Church always had been, and another part broke away, which is where Niebuhr and Bonhoeffer found themselves. There was very little, although there were courageous um, priests and courageous pastors who spoke up on humanitarian issues and some of these uh, attacked and condemned the persecution of the Jews, the churches as institutions did not do that and they confined themselves therefore largely to their own affairs. The Catholic Church tended to be a little more distanced from whatever the regime was and that, that goes back into its history, that you know, the Catholic Church always had a loyalty to somewhere else. There were other resistance movements, such as the White Rose, which originated at Munich University. 
but the impact of these groups was minimal since most of their leaders were tracked down by the Gestapo, the German security police, and removed from the scene. But the resistance that ultimately proved to be the most effective originated right where the Gestapo least expected it, in the hierarchy of the German Wehrmacht. The first seeds of resistance were sown in the organization known as the Abwehr, German military intelligence, as well as the office of General Ludwig Beck, chief of the general staff. For the first four years, most of these officers supported the Hitler regime. But all that changed in 1938. Hitler had spent millions rebuilding Germany's military forces to create a vast German Reich that would bring new Lebensraum, new living space to its citizens. But many officers on the general staff were apprehensive. In violation of the Versailles Treaty, Hitler had ordered the army into the demilitarized zone of the Rhineland. On March 12, 1938, German forces moved into Austria. Neither Great Britain nor France had intervened. But that changed when Hitler set his sights on Czechoslovakia. Several prominent Germans, including Karl Friedrich Gerdler, the former mayor of Leipzig, traveled to London to convince Britain to stand firm against Hitler's demands for Czechoslovakia. He sought that the single way of preventing a new war in Europe would be that the Western Allies, in particular uh, the United Kingdom, would strongly uh, set a benchmark and tell Hitler there is no go beyond this line. Uh, the British didn't quite know what to make of this. Uh, are they telling us the truth? Uh, uh, are there really more people like that in the, Prussia, the uh, gen German general staff? They uh, weren't themselves prepared to go to war, so they really didn't act on it. From the point of view of the British, the line taken there was, let the Germans do something themselves. It's not for us to get them out of their problem through a world war. During the infamous Munich conference, Britain's Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain gave in to Hitler's demands. The western part of Czechoslovakia, the Sudetenland, was ceded to Germany without a shot being fired. So after Munich, uh, he was at the heights of his power. Uh, he had regained all of the German-speaking territories which had been contested before except those in Poland. And it would be fair to say that very few people uh, felt that uh, he should be removed. On March 15th, 1939, Hitler finally overreached. He ordered troops into Prague in a direct violation of the Munich Accords. Next, he ordered the preparation of Fall Weiss, Case White, the invasion of Poland. This time, Britain and France saw Hitler for what he was and warned Hitler that any move against Poland would inevitably lead to a new world war. As the last days of peace ticked away, Hitler delivered a stunning coup. A non-aggression pact with his arch enemy, the Soviet Union. With one brilliant stroke, the Fuhrer had removed the threat to the Wehrmacht's right flank. The invasion of Poland followed on September 1st, 1939. England and France declared war against Germany two days later. And on September 17th, actually the day in which they cut the country in two, the Russians come in from the east. So the war ends very shortly, uh, and it's a complete and uh, total victory the, for the Wehrmacht. The British and the French don't really do anything. Uh, they're not mobilized, they don't have troops ready to go, and so they simply sit and watch even though they've declared war.
Hitler's position was now unassailable. In late 1939, Hitler traveled to Munich for the annual commemoration of his failed putsch of 1923. Surprisingly, he only gave a short talk and then left abruptly in order to catch a train back to Berlin. Thirteen minutes later, a bomb went off in a pillar right behind where Hitler had stood just moments before. The bomb had been placed by a lone assassin named Georg Elzer. Eight people were killed, but Hitler had miraculously escaped. On May 10, 1940, Hitler unleashed a new form of warfare known as Blitzkrieg, German armored spearheads supported by swarms of Luftwaffe planes pushed through the Ardennes and caught French and English forces by surprise. At the same time, German divisions also launched an attack on the Netherlands and Belgium. Rudy Rosenberg, a young Jewish boy living in Brussels, remembers. The British had a treaty with Belgium that it would come to the help of Belgium if Belgium was invaded, and Belgium indeed was invaded. A couple of days later, I could tell something was wrong. The British were beginning to pack up, and all over Brussels you could hear explosions. It was the British blowing up the bridges over all the canals and the rivers. Hitler had achieved in six weeks what the Kaiser during World War I had failed to do in four years, the defeat of France. Only 